Well, good morning. Welcome. It's good to see everybody today as we come together to worship God. A few notices before we begin, and then uh, you should have them all on the on the notice sheet. So uh, hopefully you've taken one of them as you've come in. If you haven't, do take one on on the way out. Uh, just to draw your attention to a couple of things. First of all, there'll be no Tuesday Zoom prayer meeting this week. Um, do apologise for that. We try not to uh, to to cancel that meeting uh, and try to keep it going. But you'll see from the other side of the of the sheet that I'm going to be away, God willing, tomorrow and Tuesday uh, in Bala for the EMW trustees meeting um, so so that means that there'll be no Tuesday prayer meeting just for this week but we will be meeting or willing on Wednesday evening for our time of prayer and uh, of Bible study and also then to announce uh, with great sadness the death of a very dear friend of our fellowship although she was not a member with us here uh, Pauline Pauline Huckridge um, many of us in the church remember with great affection Mal and Hazel Pierce, who were members with us for many, many years. Pauline uh, was their daughter, and we know that we've been praying for her because she's had uh, uh, a terrible cancer for a number of, of months and so on. Well, she went home to be with the Lord yesterday morning. And so we're so thankful that God has been gracious to her, and yet obviously concerned for her husband David and the family. I know you'll keep them very much in your prayers. So tomorrow, this evening we meet together at six o'clock and following this evening's meeting, we will be meeting around the Lord's table to remember the Lord's death for us. So that's uh, this evening. Look forward to seeing you back again then. Well, as we uh, worship God, let us hear the words of Peter in 1 Peter. 1 Peter and chapter 1 and verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade, kept in heaven for you. Let's pray. O Lord, our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one glorious, eternal God, who is holy in all of your ways, we are coming into your presence this morning with a sense of worship and praise and adoration and desire to hear your voice through your word and to sing your praises from our hearts. We pray that you would help us in our worship. We pray that you would help us to get rid of all distractions and that we might focus upon you, the living God, and what you have to say to us in your living word. Thank you for this time together and pray that it might bring you glory and do our souls good. For we ask our prayers in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, our first hymn is a great hymn of praise. It's number 29 in the Christian hymns. Hymn number 29. Praise my soul, the King of heaven, to his feet your tribute bring number 90 number 29 <laughs>
and you can choose lots of ways if you want to go whatever way you like. So, no, if you want to know God, and if you want to get to heaven, and if you want to really have all your sins forgiven, you've got to come to me. Because I'm the only one who is the way to real life, the way to God. I'm the only one who can tell you the absolute truth about you, and about God, and about life, and about what happens after you die, and everything. He says, I am the way, and the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now we know a little chorus about that, don't we, from Sunday school. I don't know how long it is since you sung it. But do you know the chorus? I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's what Jesus said. I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's what Jesus said. Without the way, there is no... So you can come next. Without the way, there is no going. Without the truth, there is no knowing. Without the life, there is no living. I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's what Jesus said. Who knows that little chord? Well, yeah, you know that little chord? You know that little chord? Good, good. Let's sing it then. I'm not asking for this. It goes, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Let's have a go. I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's what Jesus said again. I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's what Jesus said. Without the way, without the way, there is no going. Without the truth, there is no knowing. Without the life, there is no living. I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's what Jesus said. I can remember that one. And remember that little verse that says, that Jesus says, I am the way. Remember my story about the old story part. Even if everybody else is going in the opposite direction, there is always a way out. One way, but you've got to go the opposite way to everybody else. And that's hard. Sometimes you think, like my friend, where are we going? We mustn't go up, we've got to go down. No, 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 go on. Because there's one way, Jesus. Now, that was a nice little chorus, and we're going to sing and call him. Which says the same thing. It's a lovely hymn, but I wanted you to sing a little chorus because it tells <coughs> what this hymn says, but this hymn says a lot more, and uh, it's an older one. So it's 183. Thou art the way to thee alone from sin to death and flee. And he who would the Father seek must seek him, Lord, by thee. The next verse says, I am, Thou art the truth. The next verse says, Thou art the life. And then the last verse says, Thou art the way, the truth, the life. Grant us that way to know, that truth to keep, that life to win, whose joyous eternal flow. So we sing together number 183. <laughs>
Testament reading is taken from the book of Numbers in the Old Testament, third book in Bible, Gen- well, fourth book, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and uh, we're in Numbers and chapter 21. Numbers chapter 21. And we'll read God's word from verse 1 to verse 9. The book of Numbers, chapter 21, and we'll start at the first verse. When the Canaanite king of Arad, who lived in the Negev, heard that Israel was coming along the road to Atharim, he attacked the Israelites and captured some of them. Then Israel made this vow to the Lord. If you will deliver these people into our hands, we will totally destroy their cities. The Lord listened to Israel's plea and gave the Canaanites over to them. They completely destroyed them and their towns, so the place was named Hormah. They travelled from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go round Edom. But the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the desert? There is no bread, there is no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people, and many Israelites died. People came to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it up on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. Then, when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, he lived. We thank God for the reading of his word. Well now, shall we come to God in prayer? Let's all pray. O Lord, our God, our Father in heaven, we come before you with humility, with a sense of our need and our weakness as we approach you. We come knowing that you alone are the God in whom there is strength, in whom there is wisdom, in whom there is great power. You are the God who knows everything. There is nothing that is hidden from you. We confess that there are many things that we do not understand about this world and our lives. We do not know the future, we have no knowledge of your ways and of your purposes other than what you have revealed to us in your word. But we thank you that you have revealed enough so that we know that you are a God who is to be trusted, a God who is faithful to all of your promises, a God who has kept the promises that he made to Abraham, to Isaac and to Israel, a God who has kept his promise to send his Son into the world to be the Saviour of sinners like us. We thank you that what you have promised and kept in the past gives us confidence that when you have promised for the future, we can have confidence in you. So Lord, we come to you this morning in all of our needs, asking you to supply all necessary strength and grace. Lord, we need food to eat day by day. You have told us that we are to pray, give us this day our daily bread. And so we do, we ask that you might give us each day those things that are most necessary for our lives, to keep our bodies alive and to enable us to do all those things that you call us to do day by day. Our work, our duties, our caring for others, We pray that you would help us and provide all that is necessary. But we are more than body. We recognise that we have an eternal soul and our soul needs to be fed and to be fed on the bread of life. 
The Lord Jesus said he is the bread that came down from heaven. We thank you that we can feed on him spiritually and that we can know grace and strength and help through him. We are pray, Father, that you would feed us with that living bread today. We pray that your word might be that living bread to our soul, that it might strengthen us, inform us, encourage us, convict us, that it might in every way do its great purposes in each of our lives. We pray for one another. We ask, Lord, that you would help us as we enter a new week. We thank you that we can do so, beginning here with your people and your word, singing your praises and hearing that word. We pray that as we go on into this week, that your word would find a place in our minds and our hearts and that it would affect all the decisions that we make and everything that we do, that we might live that life that is pleasing and honourable to you. Thank you for the glorious hope that is ours, the hope of eternal life, so that we know that when it is our time to be called from this world, that if our faith and hope and trust is in the Lord Jesus, then it will be but a step between this world and the next, and we will open our eyes in glory and behold the face of the Saviour who loved us and gave himself for us. We pray for the strength and help of your Holy Spirit, that we might resist temptation, fleeing from it, and that we might be encouraged to do those things that are pleasing in your sight. Pray for those who are sick. Pray for those who are sad, and especially for those who mourn. And we ask that your comfort would be their strength. We pray that they might know that underneath are the everlasting arms of a heavenly Father. We pray that they might know that you are God, and that there is one who can be trusted in every situation, one who never changes. Lord, we pray that we might, might be more fervent in our faith and our hope and our love, that these might increase in our lives. And we ask that the gospel being preached might be the means whereby men and women, boys and girls, come to a living faith in the Lord Jesus. Take away, we pray, the darkness that shrouds men and women and boys and girls. Take away the ignorance. Take away the unbelief. Put in its place faith in the Lord Jesus Christ that we might see souls saved for all eternity. Hear our prayers we ask. Forgive our many sins for we ask our prayers in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. <coughs> our New Testament reading is from John's Gospel and Chapter 3. So let's take that now. The Gospel of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John in the New Testament and we're in chapter 3, and just reading the first 15 verses. Let's hear the word of God. John chapter 3, verse 1. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born when he's old? Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born? Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus. And do you not understand these things? I tell you the truth. We speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen. But still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, 
that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. We thank God for the reading of his word. Our hymn is number 808, hymn number 808. There have been many, many settings of Psalm 23, and this is a more recent one, number 808. The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want, he makes me lie in pastures green. Number 808. My text this morning is John's Gospel, chapter 3 and verse 14. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Our theme on Sunday mornings at the moment is the church. One of the most important questions that we can ever consider is, what is the church? And a further one is, well, why do I need the church? Some Christians today believe that you can be a Christian and you can live a faithful life for God without the church. Well, when we understand what the church is, I don't think that we can possibly come to that conclusion when we really understand what the Bible tells us the church is. Now we looked at Nicodemus last Sunday morning and the conversation that the Lord Jesus had with him and the Lord Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus about the most important subject in the world. And that is, how can a person be right with God? How can we enter the kingdom of God? How can we become a Christian? What does it mean to be a person who is a Christian? And that's where we really need to start when we're thinking about the church. Because the church is made up of those who have come into the kingdom of God. 
those who have come to faith in the Lord Jesus and who know God as their Saviour, Jesus Christ as their Lord and Saviour. So the Lord Jesus is talking to Nicodemus and he is explaining to him that this is a work of God. That a person coming to know God is all a work of God. It is something that God does. So we can say that the church is a work of God. It is perhaps the greatest work of God. One day it will be seen in all of its wonderful fullness and completion. That day will be when Jesus comes again and when he claims his church, his bride as the church is described in other places in the Bible. One day we shall see just what God has been doing. But in John 3, the Lord Jesus is explaining to Nicodemus how a person becomes a part of this glorious church. And he's saying it's a work of God. And as Jesus unfolds this teaching to Nicodemus, he explains that it is a work of God the Holy Spirit. It is a work of God the Son, Jesus Christ himself, and it is a work of God the Father. In other words, it is a work of the great triune God. The Bible declares to us that God is one God, and yet he is one God uh, in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And as Jesus has been talking to Nicodemus, he began with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit's work. He's told Nicodemus that there's no way that anyone will ever be right with God. There's no way that anyone will ever enter the kingdom of God. There's no way that anyone will become part of this wonderful church unless they're born again. You must be born again. And he goes on to explain that this new birth is the work of the Holy Spirit. And then after that, the Lord Jesus goes on to speak about his own work as God the Son. He goes on to speak about the fact that he must be lifted up in order that he will then draw all people to himself. That faith in him, faith in Jesus, is the only way that anyone can be truly saved. And we need to take hold of Christ by faith, to look to him and to believe and trust in him. And then the Lord Jesus is going to go on to speak about the, the work of the Father because he will say that just a God so loved the world that he is the one who took the first steps in sending his Son, his only Son, into the world that whoever believed in him uh, shall not perish. And God didn't send his Son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him. So the Lord Jesus is saying to Nicodemus uh, for any, any person, any man, woman, young person to be saved it requires the, the work of God, the Holy Spirit, God the Son and God the Father. They are all going to be present and at work in this glorious work of creating the church. Why does Jesus begin with the Holy Spirit? Well, he has very good reason to do that. He wants to start where Nicodemus is. He wants to start with the experience of becoming a Christian. A person becomes a Christian when God works in their life, when God, as it were, breaks in to their mind and their heart and their will. And this is the work of the Holy Spirit. This is how we experience God. It is when the Holy Spirit comes and works his great work of new birth uh, in us. And just as in our human birth, we don't really remember much about it at all. Um, we were there, but it was something that happened to us. So the new birth is something that God does to us. We may not even be aware the moment that it happens, but we certainly become aware and other people become aware that it has happened because our lives then begin to change radically and we start to live our lives for God, going in his Godward direction rather than in our own direction. 
But Jesus says now, uh, Nicodemus says more for you to understand, not just the work of the Holy Spirit in new birth. You also need to understand something about the cross. You need to know something about my work, says Jesus, my work of coming to save men and women. How is it? How is it that God can work in people's hearts? How is it that God can take someone who is a rebel and make him into a saint? How is it that God can take someone who is a sinner and make her into someone who is saved and forgiven? How is that possible? Yes, it's the work of the Holy Spirit, but in order for that to happen, there needs to be a payment for sin. There needs to be a payment paid. And so Jesus goes on to speak about his own work. And he says, I'm going to reveal to you heavenly things, Nicodemus. He says to Nicodemus, you know, you, you don't even understand the earthly things. Nicodemus is at a complete loss. When Jesus starts talking about the new birth, Nicodemus really doesn't understand what he's talking about. How can a man enter into his mother's womb a second time and be born again? You know, this is uh, Mothering Sunday, isn't it? And we think about our mothers and, and we owe a tremendous debt of gratitude towards them, not only for our, our birth, uh, carrying us for those nine months and then giving birth to us, um, but also for all the nurture and the care that our mothers have given to us over the years. And Nicodemus says, well, no, that's all happened. You can't go back and have that happening again. And Jesus says, you do not understand these earthly things. In other words, I've been explaining it in ways that you should be able to understand. I've been using a very human, earthly illustration, the illustration of being born in order to help you to understand something that is spiritual. Now, you don't understand that. How are you going to understand now when I'm going to start telling you about heavenly things because I'm now going to tell you something that will need me to reveal to you something quite glorious I'm going to reveal to you this is what Jesus is meaning I'm going to reveal to you Nicodemus something that was decided before the world began I'm going to reveal to you something that was determined between God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit before there ever was a world I'm going to reveal to you how it is that men and women and boys and girls who are rebels against God, who have sinned against God, who are going in a completely opposite direction to God, I'm going to reveal to you what God will do, because it hasn't yet happened uh, in, in Nicodemus's day, what God will do in order to deal with their sin and rebellion. And he says, it's all to do with me, the Son of Man being lifted up. That's what's going to happen. So Jesus is revealing the heavenly things here. He's revealing the things that were determined in heaven before he ever came into the world, before indeed there was a world. He's going to reveal to Nicodemus the great plan of salvation. He's going to reveal to Nicodemus the fact that there needs to be a payment for Sin. Something needs to happen in order for sins to be dealt with. We know that um, when, when we do something that is wrong and bad, there are always going to be consequences, aren't there? And we might do something that is quite serious. We, we, as children, we, we may break a window um, and uh, it's completely smashed, isn't it? And we've done it and we know it's our fault. Maybe we were playing a game, maybe it was accidental, but nonetheless, the window got smashed, didn't it? And, uh, and we go, if we're good children, we're trying to be good children, we go and confess, I did it, it was me, I was the one who broke that window. And we go and tell, we go and tell the parents or whoever it is, and maybe it's a neighbor's window, you knock on the door, I did it, it's, 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 it's my fault, I'm, I'm really sorry. Now, we may well be forgiven. And thankfully, people are quite forgiving, especially to children when they do bad things. But you know, their window is still broken. And it's got to be mended. And someone has to pay the price for that. You can't just say, you're forgiven, everything's fine, it's all fixed. It isn't fixed. You're forgiven, yes. 
someone's got to pay. Either the person who did the act has got to pay, and most children don't have a big enough bank account for that, so it may end up being the parents, but someone's got to pay for that window to be repaired. Either it's got to be the person who did it, or it's got to be the person who owns the house. And it's the same with us and God, but on a much greater scale in terms of the sin that is against a holy God. The sin that is a rebel and rebellion against a God who is holy. And even our smallest sin, even the tiniest lie, the tiniest act of theft, even the tiniest act of unfaithfulness, even the fact that we haven't worshipped God as we ought to have worshipped, that other things have been more important to, to us than God. All of that is sin that must be paid for. God is a forgiving God, but we can't just say, I'm sorry, and expect God to forgive us. Something has to happen to pay for our sins. And this is what Jesus is explaining to Nicodemus. And what he's saying is, I'm going to pay. I'm going to be one that pays Nicodemus. And how am I going to pay? I'm going to pay by being lifted up. Now, how is Nicodemus going to ever understand this? He's only going to understand it if Jesus can explain it to him through something that he understands. Through something that he understands. So he says, I'm going to reveal to you some heavenly things. What do you and I need to know about this? Well, we need to know, first of all, that Jesus came from heaven to reveal heavenly things. That's my first point this morning. Jesus came from heaven to reveal heavenly things. Look at verse 13 of John chapter 3. No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. You know, sometimes people claim that they've died and gone to heaven and come back. They haven't. What's happened to them is that they've had some experience, some near-death experience. First of all, they've not died. Because death is the complete separation between the soul and the body. And nobody dies and comes back. What's happened is that their body has shut down and that they have experienced something that is very, very near death. But they're not actually died because you only die once. But people say, I died and came back again. We know what they mean by that. And they say, well, I saw wonderful things. I, I was in heaven. Well, no, they weren't. Because Jesus says, no one, no one has ever gone into heaven. You don't go there till you die. So Jesus is saying, I'm the one who's been in heaven and come back and come into this world. And, and so we can listen to him, can't we? You see, unless someone has been in the throne room of God and listened to what's been going on in heaven, they don't really know anything of eternal things. Only Jesus was the one who came from heaven. He was there with God in the beginning. In the chapter 1 of John, um, we read that the Lord Jesus came from heaven. He was with God in the beginning. And he was God. Jesus was there before the creation of the world. And he's come from heaven into this world. He claims to be the only one who can come and reveal to us heavenly things. Because he came from there. So who are you going to listen to when you think about heavenly things, eternal things? Who are you going to listen to? Whose voice are you going to trust? Every other religion in the world, every other religion in the world originates from the world. It all begins here in the world. It begins in people's minds and hearts. It may begin with their experiences and they may have had some wonderful experiences. But every single religion in the world begins here in this world. Only Christianity claims to come from heaven and to be revealed to us 
from heaven. No wonder, no wonder the Father said on the Mount of Transfiguration, this is my Son whom I love. Listen to him, listen to him. So Jesus came from heaven to reveal heavenly things. And that means that the best thing that any one of us can do in this life is to listen to what Jesus says. If we really want to know about eternity, if we really want to know about death, if we want to know about heaven and hell, if we know, want to know about eternity, if we want to know how that we might know God, the only person who can truly tell us is Jesus. No one comes to the Father except through me, says Jesus. So that's the first thing. And then the second thing that Nicodemus and we need to know is this, that Jesus would be lifted up like the snake in the desert in order to save us. Jesus would be lifted up like the snake in the desert to save us. Now, Nicodemus would have known all about this. We might not. That's why I read it to you from Numbers chapter 21. It might not be something that we, we are too aware of. It's tucked away there in the Old Testament, and I'm fully aware that not everybody has read all of the Old Testament. hope you will do. I hope that in your life you will read the Old Testament. Um, but it's there, isn't it, in Numbers chapter 21. Uh, now, you are familiar with it because you know the symbol for the, the BMA, the British Medical Association, is a picture of a pole and there is a snake wound around the pole. And you might think that's a rather strange symbol for a medical association. But it comes from this passage in the Old Testament, the snake on, on a pole. <coughs> So Jesus is unfolding to Nicodemus these amazing truths about being saved and entering the kingdom of, of God, the kingdom of heaven. And he says, there's something you need to know, Nicodemus. And that is that what happened way back there in the book of Numbers was really a picture of something that's going to happen to me. And you need to see the connection. Now the book of Numbers is a very sad book, a very, of all the books in the Old Testament, it is probably the saddest book, because it's an account of rebellion, of grumbling, of misery, it's an account of people who hated what God was doing to them, even though it was their own fault. So what you've got in the book of Numbers is the story of 40 years of Israel wandering around in the desert. They've all come from Egypt. They've been released from Egypt. You know, the, the, the plagues, Pharaoh, crossing of the Red Sea. They've come out of Egypt. And there's a huge number of them, 600,000 men, as well as women and children. So, I mean, you're, you're looking at probably a group getting on for two million. And, and they're there, and they're wandering around in the desert because they've rebelled against God. And he says, you've got to wander around for 40 years in this desert until everyone that is over 20 years, was over 20 years old in Egypt, all of that generation will die, except for Joshua and Caleb. Even Moses is going to die before they get into the promised land and they're wandering around. And they're constantly, constantly complaining. And in Numbers chapter 21, we begin with an, a wonderful victory. God gives them an, a wonderful victory against their enemies. And then in the next breath, they're complaining. They say, oh, we, we hate this place, we hate this desert place. There's nothing to eat, there's nothing to drink, and we don't like this dreadful food that God is providing. Every morning, God is providing them with food for the day. And they don't even have to work for it. All they have to do is go and collect it. It's called manna, and it, 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 it descends with the dew. And they go out and collect it, and they can make all sorts of foods with it. But they hate that, and they're complaining. And as a result, God punishes them. And he sends these venomous snakes in amongst them. And they bite the people. And the people get sick. And the people begin to die. And at that point, they cry out to Moses. And they cry out to God. 
and God helps them. And God tells Moses to do something very strange. Tells him to make a bronze snake and put it on a pole and set it up in the middle of the camp. And he says, everyone who looks at the bronze snake will live. Now that sounds like a ridiculous thing to do. But it worked. The people who believed what Moses and God were saying looked at that snake and trusted that they would not die because of their illness, their sins. And they didn't. It worked. So Jesus says, in the same way that Moses lifted up that serpent in the wilderness, that snake in the pole, so the Son of Man is going to be lifted up. So what are the comparisons? Well, the comparison is between this snake on a pole and the Lord Jesus Christ dying on the cross of Calvary. The snake was lifted up. Jesus was lifted up, physically lifted up. He went to Calvary's cross. They laid him down. They nailed his hands to the cross and then they lifted the cross up and they put it into the hole and he hung there, lifted up, was he to die. What a saviour. Well, in both cases, death was a punishment for sin. And that is what the Bible tells us. Your sin and my sin demands the payment of death. We deserve to die because of our sins. In actual fact, that is why we die. That is why we physically die anyway. Because the, God said in the Garden of Eden that if Adam and Eve ate from the fruit of the tree uh, the, the, uh, of the knowledge of good and evil, then they would surely die. They didn't die immediately, but spiritually they died immediately, and physically they began to die. And death has come into the world because of that sin and because of our own sin as well. We die. That's why people die. God did not create us to die. He created us in his image to live. And yet by our own rebellion and sinfulness, we have brought death into this world. So in both cases, death was a punishment for sin. Also, in both cases, the snake in the wilderness and Jesus on the cross, in both cases, God provides the deliverance. <coughs> Moses, it wasn't Moses' idea. Certainly the people would never have thought of that. Who would have thought that the answer to venomous snakes was a, a snake being put up in the, on the pole? It doesn't make any sense, but it's God's way. And in the same way, who would think that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, dying on the cross all those years ago, would be the way that you and I could be forgiven of our sins and made right with God? But it is the way. God provided the way of deliverance. In both cases, someone or something had to be lifted up in public. The Lord Jesus' death on Calvary's cross was a public event. In fact, the Lord Jesus deliberately came into the spotlight on Palm Sunday. Why did he do that? You ever wondered why the Lord Jesus rode into Jerusalem and allowed the crowds to sing his praises on that Palm Sunday? Rest before that, Jesus had remained quite quiet and hidden, and often he'd moved out of the limelight in order not to be made known. But here on Palm Sunday, he is riding into Jerusalem and everybody sees him, and then he gets into the city and he is deliberately in the public gaze. Well, it's because he knew he had to die publicly so that the following Friday he would be lifted on that cross and everybody would see him. Something had to be lifted up. Someone had to be lifted up. And again, in both cases, life comes through looking. Life comes through looking. But not just looking, Looking in faith, believing. You're an Israelite and you've been bitten by a snake. You might glance up and see this pole. That's not going to save you. You're going to have to look at that snake, 
believing that you will be saved by doing that. In the same way that many people know about the death of Jesus, many people talk about the cross, but they don't actually look to Jesus in faith. They don't actually believe and trust in him. That's what we must do in order to be saved. Of course, the differences are obvious too. In the wilderness, they were going to die physically. We will die eternally if we do not look to Jesus. We will die physically anyway. Whether we look to Jesus or not, we will die physically. But there is something worse than that. The something worse than physical death is being separated from God for all eternity. That's worse than physical death. That's called spiritual death, eternal death. And that's why we need Jesus. We need to look to Jesus. Again, in the wilderness, they had physical healing. Well, when you look to Jesus in faith on the cross, you won't necessarily have physical healing all your life. You won't have good health all your life. You will get ill. But what you will get through looking in faith at Jesus Christ is you will have spiritual life. You will have eternal life. Your soul will be healed from all of its spiritual sickness. So Jesus will be lifted up like the snake in the desert to save us. And finally, everyone who believes in him is given eternal life. Everyone who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ is given eternal life. Look at that. Look at verse 15 of John 3. Well, verse 14 says, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Jesus is lifted up publicly. Many will look to him, but not all of them will be saved because we need to look to him in faith. We need to see him there and believe in him, to believe that he is the Son of God, to believe that he is the one way that God has provided for you and for me to be healed of our spiritual sickness, for you and me to be forgiven of our sins. But when we look to him in faith, believing, and that is it, just believe. You say, surely there's something else I've got to do. No, there is nothing else you can do. Jesus has done everything. You can't do anything to save yourself. All you can do is to reach out by faith to Jesus Christ and say, Lord, I'm the sinner. I need your forgiveness. Lord Jesus, forgive me. Because of your death on the cross, I look to that. Not to anything else, I look to that. That death on the cross of Calvary. And Jesus says, and this is his promise, that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. Everyone. Regardless of background, regardless of race or religion or gender or age, or anything else that divides us, without exception, everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. That's glorious, isn't it? And that's how people come to know God. That's how we come into the church of God. That is why in the book of Acts, in chapter 20, the Apostle Paul can describe the church like this. He describes the church as the church of God that he bought with his own blood. Isn't that a wonderful thing? The church is here because Jesus Christ died on the cross and shed his blood. The church has been bought with his own blood, purchased with the precious blood of Jesus. And that is how we come into the church of God. That is how we become a part of the church. It is by looking to Jesus and believing and trusting in him. And at that moment we become part of this church that is made up of people from all over the world, from every nation, through all of time, who have all looked to that same saviour and received eternal life. Church is very precious 
to the Lord Jesus? Is it precious to you? But more importantly, are you part of this blood-bought community? Have you looked to Jesus in faith and received this eternal life? If not, his appeal to you today is look. Look and live. Because he was lifted up that even now, all these years later, by faith, we can look to Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary and receive eternal life. May God give us the grace to be able to do that. Well, let's close our service this morning by singing together. This is a great old hymn. It's not just for weddings. I was put off this hymn a little because I went to so many Anglican weddings and they sang this hymn. It is a wonderful hymn about the church being the bride of Christ, but it's a glorious hymn. If you look at the end of the first verse, it's number 370. Uh, From heaven he came and sought her to be his holy bride. With his own blood he bought her, and for her life he died. So 370. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.
Thank you.